Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, prosecutors have summoned the de facto owner of the sunken Selho ferry for questioning. Investigators are also attempting to take three of his relatives into custody, but tracking them down is proving difficult. On the eve of talks between Korea and Japan on the highly emotive wartime sex slavery issue, the mayor of Osaka, who made offensive comments about the women last year, makes more controversial remarks. Plus, seven Ukrainian soldiers are killed by pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. It's the biggest single loss of life to the Ukrainian army since troops were sent into the mainly Russian-speaking east. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, May 14th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. We start with the latest on the investigation into the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. Prosecutors endured another frustrating day on Tuesday as the suspect they are most keen to talk to was nowhere to be seen when officials burst into his home in southern Seoul. The practical owner of the ferry, the elusive Yu byung An, has been summoned to appear for questioning. On Friday, a Guansua starts us off. Prosecutors rang the bell for hours since Tuesday morning, and when that didn't help, they raided Yu Dae-kyun's house along with police and firemen, but failed to arrest him as there were no signs of his whereabouts, meaning he likely fled to a hiding place. Yu Dae-kyun is the first son of Yu byung on the practical owner of the sewol -ho ferry. Prosecutors have been granted an arrest warrant for Yu Dae-kyun as he did not appear for questioning scheduled for Monday. But he's not the only person who isn't cooperating with the probe. His siblings, who are said to be abroad, failed to show up too numerous times. The Yu family and its close associates are suspected of being involved in embezzlement and tax evasion and having a direct connection to the ferry sinking as safety measures were ignored in renovating the ship and also during the process of overloading cargo. The latest investigations have revealed that Yu byung -an was involved in the management of the ferry. That's why the joint investigation team believes you could be the top person in charge and the person most responsible for the disaster. You was summoned Tuesday to appear before prosecutors on Friday. Meanwhile, the Financial Supervisory Service says it began a new probe a couple of days ago on the National Federation of Fisheries Cooperatives and Xinan Capital, which have granted loans to Yu byung -an's associates in the past. This comes as financial authorities vowed to leave no stone unturned with relation to use finances. Kwon Sua, Arirang News. Meanwhile, investigators probing the ferry disaster are considering charging the ship's captain, Lee Jun Sok, with murder because he was one of the first, of course, to abandon the ship, leaving hundreds of his passengers trapped inside and doomed to die. As well as this, the state auditor plans to launch a probe on this Wednesday into the government's response to the disaster. The government has come in for harsh criticism for its handling of the sinking and its aftermath. The Coast Guard will also be investigated. Prosecu prosecutors say some Coast Guard officials could be charged with negligent homicide as well as negligence of duty, as none of them attempted to board the sinking ferry during the early stages of the rescue mission. The Maritime Affairs Ministry has also cancelled Chung Hejin Marine's license to operate ferries on the Incheon Jeju Island route. Now, in the rest of the day's news, the nation's major political parties are now in full on election mode, releasing their campaign pledges for the June 4th local elections. With the polls taking place in exactly three weeks' time, the ruling Senuri Party and the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, are putting their final touches on their candidate nominations before registrations open. On Thursday, the candidates are allowed to hit the campaign trail from May 22nd. 17 provincial and city seats, including Seoul Mayor, will be up for grabs. Now, the war of words between the two Koreas is intensifying. North Korea threatened to wipe out the South Korean government Tuesday, a day after a South Korean official 
said the North must disappear soon. South Korea's Defense Ministry spokesperson Kim Min Sok made the unusually blunt remark at a press briefing on Monday, saying North Korea should not be regarded as a country and should vanish as soon as possible. In a statement, the North's powerful National Defense Commission accused Kim of speaking for South Korean President Park Geun-hye to inspire an all-out inter-Korean confrontation. It described President Park and South Korean military officials as the root of evil and vowed to wipe them out entirely with merciless force. The mayor of Osaka, who caused an uproar last year by claiming Japan's use of wartime sex slaves was necessary, is once again drawing criticism by saying there was nothing wrong with his comments. During a press conference Tuesday, Toru Hashimoto says his remarks had helped the Japanese public better understand the comfort women system. Hashimoto came under fire last year by saying that comfort women were necessary to maintain military discipline. More than 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese military and army brothels during the early 20th century. And unfortunately, it's against this backdrop that Korea and Japan will hold a second round of talks on the still unresolved issue of Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. But many are skeptical that any concrete progress will be made at the two-day talks that start on Thursday. Hwang Sung-hee reports. Senior diplomats from Korea and Japan will continue talks this week on Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Seoul's foreign ministry said Tuesday that Lee sang duk director general of the Northeast Asian Affairs Bureau, will meet with his Japanese counterpart Junichi Ihara on Thursday in Tokyo. The South Korean ministry said it has been holding consultations with comfort women since their first meeting with Japan last month. Government officials, including those from the foreign ministry, are currently collecting the opinions of the comfort women and others related to the victims. This will be the basis of our stance in the upcoming talks with Japan. More than 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese military at comfort stations in the early 20th century. Tokyo claims the issue was settled through a 1965 treaty when the two countries normalized diplomatic ties. The comfort women are demanding an official apology and legal compensation from Japan. The two sides may also discuss other matters, including Korea's import restrictions on Japanese fishery products that were imposed amid radiation concerns in the aftermath of the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster. Japan's push to regain the right to collective self-defense may also come up during this week's talks. Not much progress was made at the first meeting, but remarks made by U.S. President Barack Obama during his visit to Seoul last month are fueling hopes for some concrete results at the upcoming talks. This was a terrible, uh, egregious violation of human rights, even in the midst of war. Uh, was shocking. But Tokyo's sincerity in settling the comfort women issue still remains in question, as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has recently refused to follow in the footsteps of Germany in addressing its wartime atrocities. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Gun-hee is still stable and recovering in hospital after a serious heart attack last weekend. The market reaction to E's latest health problem has been rather surprising, however, as investors have been snapping up stocks, adding around 5% to the company's share price over the past two days alone. How Kim Ji-on explains what's behind the rise. 
One day after Samsung Electronics chairman Lee Gon Hee was hospitalized, shares of the tech giant gained the most they had in nine months. Shares of the company jumped 4 percent on Monday, closing the day at around 1,400 U.S. dollars. They continue with the gains on Tuesday as well, up nearly 0.9 percent. Analysts say Samsung's succession plan played a big part in the gain, as the company has a contingency for such events. Lee Sun Taeyong is likely to inherit. Inherit Samsung Electronics, the flagship of the group. He and his two sisters will be splitting up some of the group's other affiliates. There are a lot of expectations about a speedy restructuring and succession due to the deteriorating health conditions of Chairman Lee Gon Hee. During the restructuring process, the most likely scenario is that Samsung Electronics will buy more of its own shares, leading to an increase in share prices. Samsung Securities Company, Korea's largest brokerage by market value, will sell its entire stake to Samsung Life Insurance Company, another affiliate information and communication technology provider. Samsung SDS Company plans to sell shares in Korea this year. Behind me, that's the hospital where Egoni is being treated, and his health is on the minds of global investors. But this is not the first time. Lee was hospitalized back in 2008 and again in 2009, and both times shares of Samsung Electronics gained, suggesting that the company is not entirely dependent on just one individual. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Now, while Korea's per capita GDP has grown steadily over the years, the Park Geun-hye administration won't be satisfied until the number hits the $40,000 mark by 2017. But our Park Juwon tells us that goal is extremely ambitious and won't come easy. One of the key goals set by the Park Geun-hye administration is achieving a per capita GDP of over 40,000 U.S. dollars by the end of her term in 2017. There's a long way to go as last year the figure came in at about $24,000. So what challenges are likely to face the Korean economy as it aims for the $30,000 and $40,000 milestones? Experts say the first one is expanding domestic demand. As Korea's export-driven economic growth has somewhat reached its limit, the expansion of domestic demand will be the key to achieving a per capita GDP of more than $40,000. It's important to have a virtuous cycle of creating new markets in the leisure, culture and welfare sectors that will bring about further employment and output expansion. Experts point out those sectors have ample room to grow in the Korean economy. The recently released OECD Better Life Index shows Korean people work over 2,000 hours a year, far higher than the OECD average of some 1,700 hours. And the sectors related to achieving a better work-life balance have potential to grow. Increasing domestic demand in the sectors could also help address the nation's widening income gap. According to the latest OECD figures, people in Korea's top 20 percent income bracket were earning nearly six times as much as the bottom 20 percent last year, which hinders healthy growth and domestic consumption. While the focus has been on bumping up the nominal per capita GDP, experts say it ultimately doesn't mean that much. The key, they say, is developing an economy that achieves real robust growth. For example, it took the U.S. 17 years to jump from a per capita income of $20,000 to $40,000, and it took Japan eight years. The achievement was due mainly to the appreciation of yen rather than from real growth, which made the Japanese economy less competitive in export markets and ultimately led to an economic slowdown. To avoid such risks, Experts stress it's important to institute appropriate measures to induce real growth in the lesser developed areas of the economy. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Korea's exports of products related to information and communications technology were up by 4.5% on year in April. Nearly 15 billion US dollars worth of ICT products were shipped out last month on the back of strong demand from China and the US. Trade officials say strong exports of mobile handsets and semiconductors offset external uncertainties, including unstable consumer sentiment in emerging economies. 
The $7.5 billion surplus in the sector last month contributed to the nation's overall trade surplus. Now, the Korean wave is not just limited to the film, music and entertainment industries. It's also helping Korean food make a splash on the world stage. An exhibition is currently running in Seoul to help local food firms find international buyers. Our Connie Kim reports. Helped by the popularity of the Korean wave, exports of Korean food have been on the rise. And it's also local foods that are actively seeking to reach out globally. Hosted by the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency, the annual Seoul Food Exhibition set ground for small and mid-sized Korean food companies to target international buyers. The Seoul Food Exhibition will be an opportunity for food all across the world to be introduced to different countries, including Korean foods. It will be a good opportunity for small companies to promote their brands outside the country, especially since it's being impacted by the Korean wave. The event allowed visitors to experience and taste a wide range of foods firsthand. It was impressive to see vinegar and soybean paste made in pottery. I hope traditional food can spread through the Korean way. This year, a variety of dry food products such as dehydrated seaweed, fruits and powder makoli or rice liquor won over visitors for its convenience and long shelf life. For example, these small dried pieces of kimchi can instantly create kimchi stew when dropped in boiling water. Visitors say it tastes just as good as fresh prepared stew and would easily appeal to foreigners. Kotra also invited a record number of companies from 43 different countries to promote their local foods in Korea. It's for the first time when we are here, we know that the Korean people eat healthy and that's why we are here because our products are 100% natural. The company says the exhibition has laid a stepping stone for it to also establish a presence in the local market and introduce its crafted wines and organic jams to trend-sensitive Koreans. With the aim to promote local food, small and mid-sized food companies in and out of Korea plan to target a larger customer base through the exhibition, which runs until Friday at Kintex north of Seoul. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Time now for a look through our international headlines. We're going to connect to our Eunice Kim, standing by the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning, Mark. The Ukrainian government says at least seven of its men were killed in an ambush in the Donetsk region. The defense ministry says an armored personnel carrier carrying the soldiers was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade near Kramatorsk, and a firefight ensued with some 30 armed rebels afterwards. Kramatorsk falls in the region, declared independent by separatists following Sunday's referendum. Them. Meanwhile, in nearby Luhansk, separatists said their leader, self-declared Governor Valery Bolotov, was shot but was not in critical condition. Also on Tuesday, Germany's Foreign Minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier was in Kiev to help launch talks between the Ukrainian government and separatists to skepticism from officials. A mine explosion and a fire has trapped hundreds and killed several workers in Turkey as the country's disaster personnel are engaged in a massive rescue operation. A power transformer at the mine exploded Tuesday afternoon local time during a shift change. Authorities placed the number of workers trapped underground at more than 200. The number of casualties vary vastly, but at least 17 currently are confirmed to have been killed with that figure set to rise. The Associated Press reports about 20 people have been rescued so far. Rescuers are pumping fresh air into the mine as the following fire likely burned off oxygen below. And tensions show no sign of abating in the verbal battle over the South China Sea between Vietnam, China and now the U.S. Local media in Hanoi report anti-Beijing protests in Vietnam are also spreading after last week's conflict near the Paracel Islands when a giant Chinese oil rig was placed in disputed territory. China's foreign ministry said U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry should look objectively and fairly at the South China Sea dispute and, quote, act and speak cautiously, 
One day after Kerry called China's latest move provocative and called for the creation of a maritime code of conduct. And Baghdad was rocked by a series of car bombings on Tuesday, killing at least 23 people. The attacks happened in the mostly Shiite areas of Iraq's capital city as Shiites were celebrating the birthday of Imam Ali. The strikes happened in residential neighborhoods, streets and an outdoor market. Nearly 8,900 people were killed in Iraq last year, according to United Nations figures, the highest since the peak of sectarian violence in 2007 and 2008. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the 2014 Incheon Asian Games, which is another major sporting event to look forward to this year. And with the Olympic Council of Asia finishing their meeting, organizers are expecting around 14,000 athletes and delegation. With 44 out of the 45 Olympic Council of Asia members, excluding North Korea, finishing up their meeting in regards to the upcoming Asian Games, 17,918 athletes and delegations have signed up so far. However, organizers expect 20 percent to drop out in the end as they expect roughly 14,000 members to attend the Games later this year. And now moving over to the LPGA where South Korea's Park Bi was able to hold on to her number one ranking for the 57th straight week. But after this weekend, that might be in jeopardy. With the LPGA Kingsmill Championship taking place starting Thursday, the current number one LPGA golfer will not be competing. With that, American Stacey Lewis, who is right behind her at second, will be looking to become number one once again if she's able to win the title, just like she did at the North Texas LPGA shootout. Meanwhile, Pagin B, despite an incredible season last year, has not won a single LPGA title this season. And now shifting gears to the second leg of the AFC Champions League round of 16 matchup between the Chumbu Kyundi Motors and the Puang Steelers. With Puang up 2-1 in aggregate, Puang's Kim Seung Des scores the only goal in the first half of the match as the Steelers hang on to win it 1-0 and advances to the round of 8 with a 3-1 aggregate. And now with that finishing things off with some Tuesday night's KBO action, the Samsung Lions cruise past the Hanwha Eagles 7-1 NC Dinos hang on to beat the Kia Tigers 6-5 and the Tucson Bears beat the SK Wyverns 9-6. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the LG Twins take on the Lotte Giants. Of course, going into the game here now, both starters Chris Oxpring of the Lotte Giants and Everett Tiefert of the LG Twins throwing blanks across the board to start things off. But in the bottom of the fifth inning here, Che Young Charge sends this one to deep left field. And that one is Ferris' first home run in 10 years. And the LG Twins are up 1 0. Sixth inning, Josh Bell at bat singles to right and RBI single scores Pagyong Tech. And it's now 2 0 LG. Eighth inning, OG Wan, he's got a single to right field here. But check this one out. Throw to third gets away. That scores two men. And LG is up now 4 0. Next play, Josh Bell once again, this time a sack fly to center field. In comes the runner from third base, and the LG Twins hang on to give manager Yang Sang Moon his first win with the LG Twins. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee Ji-hyun with your latest weather forecast. Well, many areas in southern provinces saw a high of over 30 degrees Celsius yesterday, mid-August like temperatures. It was hot and sunny day. Well, if you didn't like the dazzling sun and hot temperatures, you're going to love today's weather. Clouds and cooler temperatures are expected across the region. Readings in Seoul will be just a couple of degrees lower than yesterday, while 5 to 6 degrees cooler top temperatures are expected for the southern regions. And right now, we are waking up to a partly sunny morning 
morning, but more clouds will be rolling into the country as we go through the day today, especially to the southern region. So it will turn to mostly cloudy day later on, and it could drop showers to Jeju Island and some of the southern coast later in the day. And over in Jindo, winds and waves will remain calm today, and waves will be as high as one meter during the day. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The high in Seoul will rise to 25, while Tech will peak at 26, and Gwangju and Busan should climb to 23 and 22, respectively. For other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon will reach 20 and 26. Dokdo should see a high of 22, while Mount Kyunggang tops out at 16. Well, that's all for now, but I'll be back with more updates after 10. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather, as always. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about 30 minutes' time, and we'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.